unless you are watching this video from orbit, and if you are, that's very cool, you have tectonic plates shifting below your feet right now. And that shifting has been the source of a lot of drama over Earth's history, from causing earthquakes to forming volcanoes and other surface features. But astronomers see some of those features on celestial bodies that never had tectonic plates like Earth to begin with. So how could the effect happen without the cause? This SciShow Space compilation will answer that question through a seismic journey across our solar system. System. Reed is first up to explain what plate tectonics do for a planet's climate, weather, and geology, and why we are even looking for them in space. Over the past few decades, we've found thousands of planets out there, and we're constantly finding more. Now we just need to sort through them to see which can support life. But that's easier said than done. Whether a planet has liquid water is probably the most important factor, and plenty of researchers spend their time looking for signs of it. But it turns out active tectonic plates are pretty important, too. It's not easy to find signs of plate tectonics on other worlds, but we're getting there. The slow drift of the continents is probably the first thing that comes to mind when you think of plate tectonics on Earth. But what's key here is that the same processes constantly recycle elements between the surface and the mantle layer below the crust. On Earth, this is believed to have been key to oxygenating the atmosphere and keeping the climate stable over billions of years. For example, the carbon dioxide from volcanoes helps keep the planet warm. But if it gets too hot, Chemical reactions between the Earth's surface and the atmosphere pull carbon out of the atmosphere and cool things back down. Without these stabilizing cycles, a planet's climate could get too hot and vaporize all the water, or too cold and freeze it. Neither would be great for life. So many scientists think plate tectonics are a crucial ingredient for the long-term survival of life on any planet. Looking at our own solar system, many of our rocky neighbors have tectonic activity of some sort faults, quakes, or volcanoes. But they're also all stagnant lid planets, meaning their crust has cooled into a single solid surface. We haven't found multiple plates or a continuously recycling crust like on Earth. So with our solar system ruled out, the search has focused on exoplanets, those orbiting other stars. Of course, it's much harder to study these planets since they're so far away. So to learn something about their geology, we infer what we can from the data available, mostly the overall physics of the planets and the stars they orbit. For example, what a planet is made of plays an important role. And we can say something about that by looking at the star it orbits, since they form from the same interstellar cloud of stuff. You need just the right combination of rock densities to create plates that will sink back into the mantle below other plates. And for that, the planet has to have certain elements in specific proportions. Based on this, one 2017 study looked at the composition of stars and concluded that about one-third could likely support planets with with plate tectonics. Water can also reduce the friction between the mantle and the crust, which could be vital to keeping the plates moving. And we know water is already a near certain requirement in making a planet habitable, so it's nice that the variables line up. When a rocky planet first forms, everything is pretty much magma, which then naturally cools into a stagnant lid. To start plate tectonics, you also need enough force to break open that lid and keep the planet's crust moving. So in general, it's thought that the more stress a planet is under, the easier it is to crack open a stagnant lid, as well as keep elements moving between the mantle and the surface. On Earth, this mostly comes from the mantle's convection, the slow movement of material that transfers heat from deep within the planet to the surface. But that's not the only thing that could drive tectonics. Planets close to their stars will have higher gravitational tides pulling on them. And a 2019 study used a computer model to show these could make plate tectonics more likely. In some cases, these tides could potentially be strong enough to drive the process of plates sinking back into the mantle. Another important factor is the planet's size. A study modeled planets of various sizes and found that as a planet gets bigger, convection stress in its mantle increases. The models also showed that larger planets tend to have thinner crusts that could break more easily. That makes super-Earths, large, rocky planets with up to 10 times Earth's mass great candidates for plate tectonics. And in fact, that's where researchers found what may be the first known exoplanet with active tectonics, in a 2021 study published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. It's called Super-Earth LHS 3844b, and it's 49 light years from Earth. There is a catch, though. These tectonic plates would look very different than the continents here on Earth. LHS 3844b is tidally locked, 
meaning the same side always faces its star. And it's in such a close orbit around a red dwarf star that the temperature difference between hemispheres is over a thousand degrees Celsius. By building a computer model of it, researchers found that the huge difference in temperature drives movement of the planet's surface. It's kind of like how the convection in our planet's mantle is driven by heat flowing from the core to the surface, except in this case, it's flowing from one hemisphere of the planet to the other. Of course, these conditions are incredibly harsh to expect to find life in. Extreme temperatures aside, the planet doesn't have an atmosphere. But it's a start. And as we get better at observing exoplanets directly, we will only learn more. Next-generation telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to look for volcanic eruptions by detecting small particles in a planet's atmosphere. This wouldn't guarantee tectonic plates are active, but it would be some nice, strong evidence. Extraterrestrial life isn't easy to find. But if nothing else, the search for extraterrestrial moving plates could help point us in the right direction. Turns out, Earth is pretty special. But if no other planet in our solar system has shifting tectonic plates, then why does the surface of Mars look like it's been hit by tectonic activity? Well, we have an answer. Ever since the 1960s, more than two dozen spacecraft have explored Mars. They've explored everything from its atmosphere to its surface to its miles-deep canyons, but none had ever explored its interior until recently. Last week, three papers published in the journal Science revealed the first ever map of the inside of the Red Planet. It's also the first interior map of any other planet besides Earth. And although Mars has the same basic makeup as Earth, this map shows that the inner layers of our neighboring rocky planet hold some remarkable differences. Now, well before these latest studies, we had a general idea of what the inside of Mars was like, because Mars formed a lot like Earth, out of a molten sphere that eventually hardened. And since it was once entirely molten, the heaviest stuff would have settled at the bottom, and the lightest stuff would have floated to the top, forming layers like Earth. As for what those layers look looked like, though, that was anyone's guess. Scientists came up with some hypotheses based on computer models and comparisons between Mars and Earth. But what they actually needed? was data. The problem was, until recently, getting direct data for a map of Mars's interior seemed like a long shot. See, one of the most effective ways of probing the inside of a celestial body is by detecting seismic waves. Here on Earth, we generally know of seismic waves as the waves produced by earthquakes. They travel through the planet, and as they reach the boundary between one material and another, they can do one of two things. Seismic waves can be reflected, meaning they bounce back like light bouncing off a mirror, or they can be refracted, meaning they pass pass through the boundary, but they change speed and direction. Depending on the materials they're moving through, they reflect and refract in specific ways. So by measuring how waves move through a planet, we can identify the boundaries between layers and say something about each layer's composition. On Earth, this is the main way we've been able to map the interior. But it's only possible because Earth has tons of seismic activity. We got all kinds of tectonic plates sliding around, crashing into each other, and generating seismic waves, even though many of them are too weak or too deep to actually feel like an earthquake. Meanwhile, up until a few years ago, planetary scientists thought Mars was pretty quiet in terms of seismic activity. It doesn't seem to have any plate tectonics to speak of, which is the main driver of seismic activity on Earth. So making a map based on seismic data seemed like it would be pretty tricky. But this view of Mars changed a few years ago, after the InSight lander touched down on the Red Planet in 2018 and began collecting data with various instruments, including a seismometer. In under a year, it had already recorded 174 seismic events, or Mars quakes. They were gentle quakes, which suggested that they came from fairly tame events, such as rocks fracturing as the planet slowly cools. Either way, though, Mars was definitely seismically active, so building an interior map using seismic data was not such a far-fetched idea. The main challenge now is that Mars had a grand total of one seismic observatory, the InSight lander. So in the absence of a bunch of global data, scientists have had to get really creative. The authors of last week's papers used multiple methods of data processing and then compared the results to see how well they agreed. They also worked with lots of specialists, from geochemists to mineralogists to sedimentologists, you name it, to wring every last drop of insight from their limited raw data. And their hard work paid off. We now have a 3D map of Mars's insides, and the results come with some surprises. Let's start with the outer layer, the crust. The authors found that Mars's crust is a few dozen kilometers thick, and it's much less dense than they expected based on the composition 
composition of the surface. That suggests that the deeper rock may have been physically and chemically altered by volcanic activity, which could make the ground more porous and create lighter minerals. One layer below that, there is the mantle. Like on Earth, Mars's mantle goes from being rigid at the top to more gooey or ductile deeper down. But the authors found that unlike on Earth, the rigid part of Mars's mantle, known as the lithosphere, goes extremely deep, some 400 to 600 kilometers below the surface. That makes it two or three times deeper than Earth's lithosphere, even though Mars is a much smaller planet. And since so much of the mantle is rigid, it doesn't convect well. There is some convection, but it's super slow, which explains why Mars has no plate tectonics. As for the Martian core, researchers found that it is liquid, as predicted, but it's about 200 kilometers bigger than expected. And considering its size, it's not particularly massive, suggesting that there's a lot of light stuff in there in addition to heavy metals. So Mars likely has a core with plenty of iron, like Earth's, but also a lot of sulfur, some oxygen, and even some hydrogen. And that could explain why Mars's magnetic field is so weak, because a rotating convecting core can set up a magnetic field if it's made of a conductive material, like iron. But if that iron is mixed with something that doesn't convect, like sulfur, a large magnetic field cannot form. For now, there's still a lot of work to do confirming and expanding on these findings, but thanks to this image, which is more detailed than any picture of Mars's interior we have ever had, scientists can model and explore the red planet in ways that were never Ever possible before. Okay, so Mars quakes are a thing, even if they are not quite as dramatic as the ones we get here on Earth. And Mars is not the only quaking rocky body out there. While InSight gave us the first real look at Mars's insides, scientists have been studying moon quakes since the Apollo era. Well, in the 1970s, Apollo astronauts placed seismometers on the moon to see what it was up to. And until the last of them was switched off in 1977, these instruments recorded more than 12,000 seismic events of varying degrees, including one quake with a magnitude of 5.5. And Mars, meanwhile, has been found to have a system of faults or fissures in the crust, and possibly volcanic activity. But moon quakes and Mars quakes are different than earthquakes. What makes moon quakes so interesting isn't so much their magnitude, but their persistence. Most quakes on Earth tend to dissipate after a minute or so, because water interacting with the rock below the surface acts like a kind of sponge to tamp down the vibrations. But not so on the Moon, which is cooler, drier, and more rigid. Its surface isn't pieced together from tectonic plates like Earth's is. Instead, it's been described as being like a tuning fork. Those old Apollo instruments have recorded shallow moonquakes lasting more than 10 minutes. Some of these are likely vibrations caused by meteorite impacts. Others are probably thermal quakes, caused by the difference in temperature between the lunar day and night, each of which lasts about two weeks. When sunlight first strikes the moon's surface, the expansion of that frozen crust can cause seismic activity. But the most common moonquakes appear to be related to the tidal stresses between the Earth and the moon. The mechanisms behind them aren't really well understood but these quakes happen pretty regularly and seem to be the result of internal stress caused by the moon's gravitational interaction with Earth. These quakes are low magnitude, but occur at great depths, as much as 700 kilometers below the lunar surface. Then there's a whole category of shallow moon quakes that originate between 20 and 30 kilometers below the surface that still have scientists baffled. Yep, we're still analyzing data from 1977, trying to figure out the origin of all the moon's quakes. Scientists know even less about Mars quakes, in large part because we don't have the trove of data that we do from the moon. In fact, only the Viking landers, which touched down on Mars in the mid-1970s, had seismometers on board. And the only quakes they detected came from vibrations as the spacecraft landed. But recent photographs by NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter have revealed intriguing new evidence of Mars quakes and volcanic activity. The orbiter revealed a pair of long gashes in the Martian surface that appear to have formed following eruptions of a giant volcano known as Elysium Mons. The mountain probably hasn't blown its top in millions or maybe even billions of years, but photographs suggest that there's still movement below the surface. The key evidence is fresh boulder tracks, traces left in the Martian soil by the movement of huge boulders, which scientists believe could only have been caused by seismic activity. A 2012 analysis of the tracks from boulders, ranging in size from 2 to 20 meters, found that the number and size of the tracks decreased over a radius of 100 kilometers from the faults around Elysium Mons. Scientists estimate that a relatively recent Mars quake, with at least a 7 
7.0 magnitude, was responsible for jarring these boulders loose. So hey, Los Angeles and Tokyo and Mexico City, I guess it's good to know we're not alone, uh, right? So it looks like you can get quakes on any rocky body, be it a planet or moon. But what if the body doesn't have any rocks at all? because it is a giant ball of plasma. Is there such a thing as a star quake? Well, it turns out there is, and it can happen on living stars as well as dead stellar remnants. These star quakes might even be behind some pretty weird phenomena. Earthquakes are a reminder that there's way more going on under our feet than you might think. But it's hard to know exactly what it's like inside our planet, since we can't just, like, dig a big hole and look. On the bright side, earthquakes themselves give us a way to sort of see inside the Earth, because the properties of seismic waves say a lot about the materials they pass through. And that's not just the case for Earth. We've detected seismic activity all around the solar system. Moon quakes, Mars quakes, Venus quakes, and we can use those tremors to learn about the interiors of those places, too. But the most dramatic quakes we know of actually happen on stars. Certain types of stars can have quakes a lot like planets, and they can give us rare clues about what it's like inside those stars. On top of that, star quakes may be behind at least three unsolved mysteries of the universe. The fact that star quakes happen at all might sound weird, since stars are just balls of gas and plasma. They don't exactly have tectonic plates or a solid crust to rattle around. Except waves of energy can roll through some stars, a lot like seismic waves, and certain stars actually do form a sort of crust. Neutron stars are basically a giant ball of neutrons, and their gravity is so intense that it forces the surface material into a solid, rigid crust. Beneath that crust, there's a wobbly layer of what's called nuclear pasta, which may be the most elastic and robust material in the universe. And that's the real name for it! So these features of neutron stars are weirdly analogous to the Earth's crust and mantle. There is a slightly squishier, more mobile layer underneath a relatively brittle one. Which means that the basic principles that drive earthquakes should also work on a neutron star. And that just might help explain something astronomers so far have no explanation for. Fast radio bursts, or FRBs, are short pulses of radio waves that seem to be tied to neutron stars. Sometimes we randomly see these pulses in one location, and they never come back. But on rare occasions, we've also detected repeaters, FRBs, that come from the same source more than once. And that's awesome! More bursts means more data. One repeat Repeating FRB in particular is giving us some especially intriguing data. We've detected around 300 bursts from this one source over eight years. And when you put together a plot with all of the different energies from those bursts, it looks a lot like the distribution of energies associated with earthquakes in one area. Even the timing looks familiar. The timing between bursts looks like the timing you'd see between an earthquake and its aftershocks. So this thing is looking suspiciously earthquake. -y. At this point, we don't have enough data to say for sure that this FRB is caused by a neutron star with star quakes, let alone that all FRBs are produced this way. But it gives astronomers a promising direction to explore. And that is not the only mystery they're investigating in neutron stars. Certain spinning neutron stars, called pulsars, have occasional unexplained glitches. Pulsars get their name because they appear to pulse. As they spin around, electromagnetic jets shooting out from their poles come in and out of our line of sight. Since their rotation rate is essentially constant, those bursts of radiation are spaced super evenly. If we were to see any change in their timing, we'd expect a gradual slowing down because those jets carry energy out of the system, so there's less energy remaining to keep up that rotation speed. So imagine astronomers' surprise when they saw pulsars that briefly started flashing faster. That's a pulsar glitch. A glitch because it's not supposed to happen, unless there is more to this story. And that's how astronomers began to wonder if star quakes were involved. See, as quakes rattle through a star, its insides get all disheveled and its mass slightly redistributes itself. When that happens, the center of mass moves. And if the center of mass of a rotating object moves closer to the axis of rotation, it's gonna spin faster just like an ice skater. Try it for yourself in your swivelly desk chair. Start spinning around, then pull your arms 
arms and legs in and get real dizzy. So that's exactly what some astronomers think is happening in pulsars. They think quakes are moving the center of mass and making these stars spin faster. Like with FRBs, this is not confirmed, so scientists will keep looking into it. In the meantime, astro-seismologists have their hands full with another mystery, something called the Blasco Effect. Got lots of good names in today's episode. The Blasco Effect happens in a type of variable star called RR Lyres, whose brightness goes up and down on a regular cycle. And the star that gave the group its name, RR Lyrae, is one of the best-known examples of the effect. RR Lyrae's brightness goes up and down with regular peaks and troughs about once every 13 and a half hours. That happens thanks to waves of hot, charged gas moving through it. But if you look at those brightness oscillations over a very long period of time, you will notice that the peaks themselves rise and fall. That is the Blasco effect, and we don't really know how it happens, but something seismic might be at play here. RR Lyrae stars don't have a crust like neutron stars do, so they don't have the same kind of star quakes, but seismic waves could still be shaking things up. For instance, if the waves of heated gas move through different layers of the star at different rates, they could periodically line up in a way that might amplify peaks. And that could potentially account for that second cycle of peaks and troughs that no one knows how to explain. And even though none of these mysteries are solved, they all show us that shaking up a star is a good way to learn about it, and that star quakes hold a surprising number of clues to the internal workings of celestial objects. Starquakes may be responsible for cosmic mysteries light years beyond our solar system, but the rocks closer to home have a few mysteries up their own proverbial sleeves. Take Jupiter's moon Io, for example. It's got hundreds of active volcanoes, but a bunch are not where astronomers think they should be. Luckily, they have a few ideas why. Earth's moon might look like it's made of cheese, but Jupiter's moon Io seems a lot more delicious. I mean, look at this thing. It's like a giant pizza with all kinds of crazy toppings. Io has all those blobs for a good reason. It's full of active volcanoes, so many that it's the most volcanically active body in the solar system. We're talking more than 150 active volcanoes, some with 400-kilometer-high eruptions. But those weird-looking spots are also a kind of mystery, because the volcanoes on Io aren't where astronomers expected to find them, which might mean that the moon has an underground magma ocean. The mystery comes from how Io's volcanoes are thought to form, which has to do with the gravitational pull of Jupiter and two other moons, Europa and Ganymede. As Io orbits Jupiter, the gravity from each of these worlds tugs its insides in a particular way. It's called tidal flexing, and it stretches the moon, deforming its surface by up to 100 meters at a time. Io's insides are getting stretched and squeezed, and the friction from all that rock moving around produces a lot of heat. Like enough heat to melt the rock into magma in some spots. So for a long time, astronomers have been using what we know about the way Jupiter and its moon's orbit to predict exactly where the hot spots should be. And you would think that Io's volcanoes would be right on top of those hot spots. It would make sense for the magma to be erupting from the places that have the most of it, but it turns out that's not where the volcanoes are. In 2013, a group of researchers led by an astronomer named Christopher Hamilton modeled Io's tidal flexing to map out the warmer spots. When they compared that map to the actual locations of the moon's volcanoes, they found that the volcanoes were shifted much farther east, by 30 to 60 degrees. They came up with two main reasons why that could be. The first possibility is that we're wrong about how fast Io rotates. If it spins faster, then its insides might be heating up more and messing with the volcanic plumbing. The hot spots could be in totally different places, shifted east, for example. Or the model for Io might have been off because of the magma ocean astronomers think is hiding below Io's surface. Scientists have found evidence for an ocean like this before. Back in 2011, a separate team of researchers predicted that Io had a magma ocean 30 to 50 kilometers beneath the crust, which would help explain some unexpected measurements the Galileo probe detected in Jupiter's magnetic field. In a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal Supplement series in June 2015, a third group, which included Hamilton, modeled how an underground magma ocean like that would affect the flow of heat inside Io. The ocean in their model would cover the entire moon, and it would be kind of sponge-like, slowly moving around below the surface thanks to the tidal pull caused by Jupiter, Ganymede, and Europa. The researchers found that this flowing magma could explain the shift in the volcano's locations by generating even more friction and heat as it moves, which means that the mystery of Io's misplaced volcanoes might just be another piece of supporting evidence for the idea that there is a hidden layer of magma ocean sloshing around inside the moon. Now, Io isn't the only world that gets to have a bunch of volcanic activity without plate tectonics. Venus does as well, and its surface is covered in volcanic features that scientists cannot fully explain. Here's what we know from the Magellan mission, and what is still a mystery on that front. 
Venus is often described as Earth's evil twin, and we get it. I mean, the planets are very similar in size and mass. Except, you know, Earth is a generally nice place with plenty of water and green things. And Venus is a fire world of scorching temperatures and crushing pressures, all wrapped in thick sulfuric acid fog. And that fog is kind of a pain. but. Not for the obvious reasons. Because of this blanket of cloud, we didn't know that much about Venus until the early 1990s, when NASA's Magellan mission arrived. Magellan gave us unprecedented insight into Venus's rocky surface, and along the way, it raised a few questions, too. And did we mention it launched from a space shuttle? Fairly early on, modern astronomers realized that regular cameras can't see through Venus's clouds, but Radar can. That's because radar uses microwave and radio waves, which are long enough that they don't get scattered by Venus's atmosphere. That means they can pass through the clouds, bounce off the surface, and give us an image of what lies beneath. So with radar, we learned a few things. Like Venus spins backwards compared to other planets. But even the best radio telescopes on Earth could only image the surface to a resolution of one or two kilometers. In other words, the sensors would miss anything smaller than New York City's Central Park. So a number of spacecraft were sent to Venus to get a better look, including ones in NASA's Mariner program and the Soviet Union's Venera missions. But even then, these spacecraft still only looked at a small part of the planet. So if we really wanted to learn about Venus, we needed to step up our game. Cue NASA's Magellan mission. Its main goal was to use radar to map a much bigger portion of Venus's surface. and that it did. The spacecraft launched in 1989, and was actually the first interplanetary spacecraft to be launched from a space shuttle. Once the space shuttle Atlantis was in Earth's orbit, a robotic arm carefully maneuvered the Magellan out of the payload bay. Then, when the shuttle had drifted far enough away, Magellan fired a solid rocket booster to send it on its way to Venus. It arrived 15 months later, and spent the next four years circling the planet. Magellan traveled from north to south, so between each orbit, Venus rotated a little underneath it. That meant Magellan could measure a new strip of ground on each pass. In fact, by doing this, Magellan covered the entire surface of Venus six times. After its first three rounds, it had mapped 98% of the surface to a resolution of 300 meters or better. That meant that scientists could now pick out features the size of a few football fields, or the size of the New York Met to stick with the Central Park theme. After that, Magellan spent the next three rounds mapping the strength of Venus's gravity by measuring how much the spacecraft was pulled toward the surface at various spots. And then it was time to say goodbye. In October, in October 1994, Magellan was commanded to plunge toward Venus's surface, and it burned up in the atmosphere not long afterward. In the end, Magellan's data created the most complete map of Venus ever made, and decades later, it's still our most detailed map of the surface. It lets scientists finally see the full range of diversity of features down there, and it also uncovered a few surprises. Like it showed us that Venus's surface looks incredibly pristine for a four and a half billion year old planet. For instance, its craters look brand new. They haven't been eroded smooth like they have here on Earth. Researchers think that's because erosion on Venus is really slow, mostly thanks to the surface being extremely dry. Without water to speed things along, features can stay sharp for tens or hundreds of millions of years. Magellan also showed us that those features are almost all volcanic. On Earth, the crust is a mixture of rocks that come from magma, riverbeds, high temperatures and pressures, and loads more. But on Venus, volcanic features make up 85% of the surface. Magellan's maps reveal lava plains, shield volcanoes, lava domes shaped like pancakes, and lava channels hundreds of kilometers long. Previous surveys of Venus had shown some of this volcanism, but Magellan showed us for the first time just how extensive it is. And this was especially surprising, considering that Venus doesn't have any obvious kind of plate tectonics. On Earth, most volcanoes form at the 
boundary of two tectonic plates, since it's easier for magma to rise there. But from what we know so far, there's none of this on Venus. That suggests there are very different processes going on inside the planet, even though its size and composition are similar to Earth's. Without more information from beneath the surface, scientists can't be sure exactly what these processes are. But so far, the data points to plumes of magma rising from Venus's mantle and creating hot spots, like the one beneath Hawaii. Now, a final surprise from the Magellan was that Venus has relatively few impact craters. Compared to Mercury or Mars, it's really smooth. This might be because its thick atmosphere has helped shield it from meteors, causing the rocks to burn up before they reach the surface. But the number of craters also suggests that the surface is pretty young, no more than about 800 million years old. For comparison, there are parts of Earth's crust more than four times that age. Without faster erosion or plate tectonics, it's not clear why the older rocks are missing. But scientists think Venus's surface must have undergone a huge resurfacing at some point, where newer volcanic features replaced everything that came before. Researchers are still unsure exactly how long this took or why it happened, and it'll take even more detailed studies of rocks all over the planet to get to the bottom of this. So we really don't know why the surface of Venus is the way it is. Space is full of mysteries. No earth-shattering news there. Just add it to the list of cool things we'll keep exploring. And thank you for exploring the quakes, plates, and crusts of our solar system with SciShow Space. For more mysteries surrounding natural disasters in space, check out our video about three mysteries solved by extraterrestrial tsunamis. 